things off when we met. We went through, generally speaking, the entire uh, section or subsection around the learner in Islam. And then we started to talk about the teacher or the scholar, beginning with the discussion around who is the true scholar or the true teacher in Islam. Because this is an important heading to keep in mind as we go through the ahadith, we go through the Islamic teachings that have to do with the person who carries the knowledge. And we said that first and foremost, it is always going to be the infallible, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is directing everyone who follows him to go towards the Imams, to go towards Ahlul Bayt And then to the extent that others refer back to the teachings of the Holy Prophet and the teachings of the Imams, then they are considered to be carrying the teachings of the Holy Prophet and to be true scholars of this religion. The second discussion then was to start to know who is this teacher and starting with understanding the importance of choosing the right scholar, the right teacher as the source of our religious knowledge, the source of our information in religion. And we said that the importance of this person goes beyond the nature of the information or the amount of the information that they convey because they are affecting us whether we realize it or not. They play a much bigger role in molding us, the way we are, how we conduct ourselves, our general attitude. And so it's very important to be very selective. And our religion has given us a large number of criteria that allow us to truly go after the person who meets this criteria that represents the teachings of this religion. And so this is when we started to talk about not only the characteristics, because we said it's one and the same thing. When you go through these narrations, some of them mention characteristics, some of them mention duties and responsibilities of the scholar or the teacher. In truth, they are one and the same. Every characteristic is in fact something that you have to strive, you have to work hard to achieve and fulfill. It doesn't happen as is just because you carry knowledge, therefore you are going to be a true scholar in religion. So this means that there's a lot of work to be done so that you can match that description. So in other words, it's a duty or a responsibility. So this answers both questions at the same time. What are the traits and characteristics of the scholars? while also answering the question, what are the duties and the responsibilities of the scholars? And we said these fall in, in a number of categories. Some of them have to do with the duty towards knowledge itself and what to do with the knowledge. And today, inshallah, we're going to start by some hadith that bring us back to that whole discussion, that the scholar is someone who is entrusted, is a trustee over knowledge, and therefore they have to act accordingly. There's a spiritual duty or a spiritual responsibility towards it and that you have to act on it in a way that affects you, that makes you grow spiritually. This is one of the main duties of the person who is the teacher and the scholar is that they have been affected by this knowledge, the spiritual aspect of it, that they have to give a lot of importance to the afterlife, that they have to conduct themselves in a way that is aligned with and seems, does not seem to be in contradiction with any of the teachings that they, are, they have learned and that they are imparting to others. We said that there are duties and responsibilities towards the learners, and there's a certain conduct to be expected towards the learners themselves. And there are also social duties and responsibilities that fall in you know, different headings, including the political, including social justice, including equity in society that have to accompany the knowledge that one carries. And we touched on those towards the end of that discussion. And we also said that there's a general conduct, the manners, the general etiquettes, the general attitude in life, the priorities in life, and so on and so forth. All of those also fall under the general duties and responsibilities of those who carry the knowledge. Now that we have done all of this, then we went to, therefore, someone who matches all of this description, or to a large extent, to enough of an extent, they also have rights over us. So what are some of those rights? And we said if we had to 
summarize it maybe in one heading or one word, it would be to honor this person. And then a lot of the ahadith that we saw are in fact specific types of honoring this person. And it's not to honor the person, to honor this person for their sake, for their own sake as an individual, as a person. It is to honor this person for the knowledge that they are carrying. To the extent that they are spreading that knowledge, that they are acting according to that knowledge, as we saw in the ahadith, then we can continue to honor this person accordingly. And, of course, the more they are doing this, then the more they are deserving of these honors. And so we went through a number of these headings just to give a good oversight of these uh, rights of the teacher or the scholar in Islam. These included, for instance, the importance of visiting, accompanying, being in the presence of these scholars, to listen to them, to ask them, to learn from them, to follow them. We even had a discussion around lowering the voice and the manners around that, and we linked it back to the Holy Quran. We spoke about obedience and we spoke about servitude or serving this person and what it could potentially mean. With all of this said now, we want to finish the discussion around the teacher or the scholar with this last heading, which is the merit. This person that has worked this hard, which comes with all of these characteristics, which are also duties and responsibilities, comes with a very, very heavy burden and I remind you of the discussions we had around the responsibilities of the scholar, the importance and the how every bad deed, every sin that may be forgiven to someone else, uh, 70 sins of the commoner are going to be, for instance, forgiven before a single sin of a scholar is going to be forgiven and so on and so forth. We saw that with this heavy duty and with this heavy responsibility, one may wonder, why would I ever want to undertake this type of journey and try to become a teacher or a scholar in Islam? And so, yes, there were rights, but the rights in themselves are not really about the teacher. You know, some people may be interested in those, but the truth is the rights have more to do with, you know, how we conduct ourselves to create that type of society so that knowledge is being spread in the best possible way and that we benefit from that knowledge. A lot of the rights have to do with that, and we'll come back to this quickly in our discussion on the community. Really, the answer comes starting today, inshallah. We're going to start the discussion on the merits, the favors, the rank of the teacher and the scholar. And this is basically, as we would say today, you know, the carrot. This is what would incite you and drive you and motivate you towards becoming a teacher or a scholar in our religion. Is that yes, the burden, the, hev the, the duty, the characteristics, the responsibility are very heavy. In fact, they can be even very scary. But at the same time, the rewards are great. And so today, inshallah, we're going to start talking about the greatness of these rewards, the how much greater it is to fall in this category of being a teacher and being a scholar over, for instance, being a worshiper in our religion. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that. This is a topic that we addressed and we talked about earlier in the series. We're coming back to it right now. The similarity or the analogy that we're going to see and how these people that fall in the category of the teacher and the scholar, how close they are to those who fall in the category of prophethood. There are There is an insistence in the narrations that there is something similar, that they are the closest of people in rank to them, and so on and so forth. We'll talk quickly about that. And then, of course, perhaps the greatest discussion around all of this has to do with the ranks and the positions of these people in the afterlife. This is when you see the true merit and the rank of someone. So we'll talk, we'll see a a number, a sample of hadith narrations that talk about the, the rank, the merits of scholars and teachers in the afterlife and the hereafter. So let's start quickly with first a very general hadith that already gives us a lot of the subheadings that we're going to be seeing. This one gives us the general rule. There's this hadith that we have mentioned very quickly earlier in the series from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu In fact, it's mentioned by Imam al-Sadiq that the Holy Prophet has said, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا فَقَّهَهُ فِي الدِّينِ 
If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends to be good towards a servant, then He will make the servant someone who carries a deep understanding of religion, a vast knowledge of religion, a specialized knowledge of religion. It's very difficult to translate this term of fiqh, faqahahu fi din. Today, in our minds, because of you know how the term has evolved over time, we understand fiqh as meaning the legal aspect of our religion. But if you go back to the narrations of the Holy Prophet in his time and the time of the Emma, fiqh was not used to mean the legal aspect. It meant religious knowledge in general. Someone who has a deep, specialized understanding of religion. Someone who truly understands at a technical level the different aspects of religion. So it's not contained just to the legal aspect, for instance. It includes... For instance, understanding beliefs. It includes, for instance, understanding the whole discussion on you know, our spiritual faculties, or today we would call it akhlaq. It would include understanding the Holy Quran and its sciences and its, uh, its verses and their meanings and so on and so forth. All of that falls under the general heading of fiqh in our religion, if you go back to the ruwayat. Within that, with time, the manner in which it was used and the manner in which it evolved over the centuries, fiqh started to become much more specialized and much more used specifically for the legal aspect of our religion, the laws. The halal, haram, mustahab, mubah, makruh. Okay? So, that said, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا فَقَّهَهُ فِي الدِّينِ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to be good, so this is a very lucky, very fortunate servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give one of his servants a lot of good, he gives him a deep, vast, specialized understanding of religion. فَقَّهَهُ فِي الدِّينِ so in general, this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being good towards you, this can go very far. That's why we said we're starting the discussion with this our discussion around the merits of the scholar or the teacher, the general understanding is this person has already been endowed with a great good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should feel special. They should feel unique because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them a very special blessing. Then we have these two ahadith that I think start to give us a sense of the true measure of perfection or the true measure of greatness the true measure in the sense that in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not in the eyes of the people not by the measure and the indication of this world whether someone is great or not someone is perfect or not may be very different from how us human beings look at it versus how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at it so the first hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam he says, Al-Kamalu Kullu Al-Kamal. Al-Kamalu Kullu Al-Kamal. At-Tafaqahu fi al-Din. Wa-Sabru ala al-Naibah. Wa-Taqdeeru al-Ma'isha. He says, Perfection, true perfection, lies in gaining a deep understanding of religion. One. Two. Patience in the face of adversity. And three. And contentment or economy in subsistence in your livelihood so three things the imam is basically saying knowledge patience and detachment from this world if you have those three the imam says this is someone who has a very high level of excellence very high level of spiritual perfection the true perfection the reason why we are created the reason why we are in this world to have vast knowledge, you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you and you act accordingly. This is the outcome of that knowledge. And true, you are able to face the difficulties of this world. You stay patient. This world is trials and tribulations and difficulties. How patient are you? How much patience do you show in the face of this? That's two. And three, the imam says, and detachment or contentment. So you're happy with what you have even if if sometimes it's very little, one, or the other way, taqdeer can also mean that you are someone who doesn't want more. So we can say it as contentment or economy in subsistence, in livelihood, that you're happy with a little. 
You're not constantly falling in the disease of this world, which is the more you want, the more you have, the more you want. Right? This is the problem of this world. This is the problem of the material aspect of this world, that it is not ever enough. The more you have, the more you want. The second hadith in relation to all of this, very linked to this one, is a hadith we saw very early in the series as well, from Prophet Isa alayhi salam, reported from Prophet Isa alayhi salam. He says, Man alima wa amil wa allam. And there are slight variations of this hadith, but this is a well known hadith. Man alima wa amila wa allam udda fil malakut al a'zami azima. So the one who acquires knowledge, who acts upon the knowledge, and who imparts the knowledge to others, who teaches the knowledge to others. So you do all three. You learn, you act, and you teach. This person is deemed, is considered in the greatest realm, in the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the heavenly realm, right, in the great kingdom, as being great. This is the person who is great. The person who has greatness in that kingdom truth in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the greater kingdom, not this low life. In that kingdom, that person is great. The person who can do all three. You learn, you act based on what you learned, and then you impart it to others. You pass it on to others. The person who does all of these three is truly great. They may or may not be great in this world, but in that kingdom, they are great. Okay, that's a true greatness. So as we said, this is already mentioned earlier in the series. And we said here the link, I think, is very clear in this hadith. Yes, we are highlighting the greatness or the merit or the favor of the scholar, of the teacher. But here we see the link. It's not just being a scholar or a teacher. It's because you're working hard to maintain that, that title or to maintain that status that you have to learn and you have to act based on what you learned and you have to keep imparting it to others. It's coming with conditions. These conditions, I think, inshallah, we spent enough time on them earlier in the series that we don't have to keep repeating them for every hadith that we are looking at. But they are there and for every single time that we see one of these favors, one of these merits mentioned, the more you can remember these and see them acted upon, the more this hadith is going to apply to someone. And here the reason we mention this hadith is of course this time to highlight the greatness of this person. In the past we mentioned it to highlight the duty of this person. Okay. The next hadith. The next hadith is I thought a very interesting one. It can open the door to a very very lengthy discussion which we will try not to fall into. This hadith from mentioned from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam has to do with this notion of infaq. Infaq in our religion is usually associated with spending for charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you sustenance and you take a portion of that and you give it for charity, for as alms. That notion is well known. And we also have a large number of ahadith in our religion that I think are also very popularly, famously known by all good Muslims, that the best way to perform the charity of knowledge is to spread it or to teach it, right? Zakatul ilm ta'limu. In multiple, multiple variants or versions of this hadith, most Muslims know this hadith. So I wanted to take it one step further in this hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, as he's doing a commentary of some verses of the Qur'an, right from the beginning of the Holy Qur'an in Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Chapter 2 at the very beginning, from the beginning. Surah Al-Baqarah starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim, Thalika al-Kitabu, La Rayba Fih. Okay, so keep that in mind. The person is asking the Imam, and the Imam is explaining the meaning of these verses. So he says, Thalika al-Kitabu, La Rayba Fih, Hudal lil-Muttaqeen, قَالَ بَيَانٌ لِشِيعَتِنَا This is what the Imam starts by saying. هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ So the Imam explains. We're going to come back in English and repeat it. 
Then he's, he re- recites the next verse. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ قَالْ مِمَّا عَلَّمْنَاهُمْ يَبُثُّونَ وَمِمَّا عَلَّمْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ يَتْلُونَ So, the verses start, Alif Lam Mim. Then it says, certainly, this is the book in which there is no doubt, a guidance for the pious, for the God-fearing. So the Imam right away here, he gives an explanation. Those, It's a guidance for those who are pious. He says it is an explanation for our followers. Our followers can receive fully this guidance because they follow the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Others will not benefit fully from this guidance. Then he says, those who believe in the unseen, who establish prayer, and who spend out of what we have provided for them. This is the idea of spending, right? They spend, they do infaq, of what from that which we have provided for them, the rizq. You would think this is about money, this is about wealth, and you spend a part of that wealth, you give it in charity. Okay, these are the main characteristics. The Imam gives you another an understanding of this verse. He says, from what we have taught them, they teach others. And they, so they spread those teachings. And from what we have taught them from the Quran, they recite. So when the ayah says, رزقناهم, we have given them rizq, we have given them a sustenance, we have given them bounties and blessings. The bounties and the blessings are not money in this case. It's not wealth. It's not material possessions that you spend. Which is the case. That is certainly the case. That understanding is clear. The Imam is adding another understanding. That truly, the true blessing that we have received, the true sustenance that you have is the knowledge. And the Imam says, and here there are layers. The Imam says, first, the knowledge that you have received, you are spreading it. You're teaching it to others. And then he goes one layer further. And he says, وَمِمَّا عَلَّمْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ يَتْلُونَ He says, it's not just all the teachings in general. Specifically teachings related to the Holy Qur'an. What do they do? They recite. We would translate it as they recite. Except that most likely here, it's not about just reciting the Holy Qur'an. And maybe the key is that the Imam says, in both cases, he's saying, we have taught them. From what we have taught them, they spread. They teach others. Who's we? Ahlul Bayt, We have taught them teachings. We have shared with them knowledge. This is the knowledge that they share with others. And when it comes to the Holy Quran, the Imam is saying, we have given them an understanding of the Holy Qur'an. Yes, it's important to recite the Holy Qur'an. But here the Imam is explaining مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ From what we have given them as sustenance, they give to others. This is infaq. So what are you giving to others if you're simply reciting the Qur'an? So here reciting the Qur'an is going much further than simply uttering the words of the Holy Qur'an. The Imam is saying, we have taught them the meanings of the Qur'an. We have explained to them the teachings of the Qur'an. And this is what they do a tilawa of. This is what they recite. This is what they impart and teach to others. And of course, here there's a whole discussion. So when we read these verses, this is perhaps not the meaning that will come to your mind or mine when we see these verses. We have to go back to the ver- to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt salam when they go through these verses and they explain these layers of meaning. They're not intuitive. In fact, in most of these cases, when you go through the explanations given, the teachings given by Ahlul Bayt salam and sometimes they vary greatly, and they're not in contradiction. The Imams are showing us the layers upon layers of meaning contained in the Holy Quran. But you see that no one can come up with this by themselves. Reading the verse of the Qur'an by itself, you would only think of the meaning of the words, Arabic. In Arabic, what does رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ mean? 
from that which we have given them as sustenance, they give to others as charity, as an act of charity. You would never think that the sustenance is teachings. The sustenance is knowledge. The sustenance is the meanings of the Qur'an. And that you have to therefore spread them to others once you learn them. It's not enough that you learn them. You have to spread them to others. This makes you fall. The beauty of these verses, inshallah, one day we'll talk about them. The beauty of these verses in Surah Al-Baqarah when they start, they give you a number of characteristics of who the true believer is. The one who believes in the hidden Right, The one who establishes prayer, performs the zakah, and then they perform this act of charity that the imam just described. If you meet all of those, then you meet the, the full description of the true believer. And then here, perhaps very quickly in this hadith, and we see this in many, many hadith, sometimes very explicitly done, and sometimes it's a little bit more subtle. This one would be more subtle. But it's always there. The importance of the Holy Quran. Always. No matter where you look in our religion, it's bringing you back to the Holy Quran. The Imam here spoke about knowledge in general. He said those who teach from what we have taught them. And then he pointed out, singled out the Holy Quran. And those who recite the Quran as we have taught them to recite it. Okay, so that's the first hadith. The second hadith related to all of this idea of infaq and of giving and the charity associated with knowledge. And don't forget that we're talking about this not as the duties related to knowledge. We're done with that discussion. That part is clear. We're talking about the merit of this person. We're saying that the person who does this is the person who best matches the description of the true believer. Okay? So the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says in the next hadith, مَا تَصَدَّقَ النَّاسُ بِصَدَقَةٍ مِثْلَ عِلْمٍ يُنْشَرُ People have never given a charity comparable to the charity of knowledge that is disseminated. People might think that the greatest charity that you can give is most likely monetary, financial. You give money. That's a great charity. Here the Holy Prophet says, no, the greatest charity, there is no charity that compares to it, is a knowledge that is disseminated, that keeps being spread. And here, perhaps there are two meanings. The first meaning, I think, inshallah, is very clear. This is what we understand. That once you learn, you have to perform an act of charity with the knowledge that you have, which is give it to others, pass it on to others. And that opens the door to the whole discussion we had on what does it mean to teach, what does it mean to spread, what does it mean to speak. We talked about all of that. So inshallah, that part, that first meaning is clear. This is the first form of the act of charity. You learn and you perform an act of charity by teaching. Okay. The second meaning, however, is perhaps in the sense that you are not yourself performing the teaching. Perhaps when the Holy Prophet says, مَا تَصَدَّقَ النَّاسِ بِصَدَقَةٍ مِثْلَ عِلْمٍ يُنْشَرْ People have never given a charity like the charity that is a knowledge that is being disseminated. This may also be understood as you're not necessarily the one spreading it. You're not the one who learned and then went to teach. You're actually giving money, for instance, monetary charity, but it's going towards spreading knowledge. So the greatest of charities, you have an amount that you want to give as a charity. And all of it is important, and all of it is necessary. But if you had a choice to make, if all things being equal, all things being equal, where should that money go? The Holy Prophet is telling us here. The best place for it to go is to spread knowledge. There's no charity that will compare to the spread of knowledge. So put your money there, if, if you have money to give. Of course, as I said, all things being equal. Because sometimes there are necessities. If people need that money for their survival, perhaps that's a, that's a priority at that time. 
Okay? But if everything else is equal, you fully have a choice, to you it's very difficult to make that choice. Where should that money go? One of the greatest places, if not the greatest, the Holy Prophet is saying, is to spread knowledge. Okay? That said, this is kind of a more subtle, deeper meaning of this hadith. Because the first meaning, the clear meaning is you learn and you teach and that teaching is considered an act of charity. So in what sense is that a merit of the scholar? This is a merit of the scholar because it means that the scholar is the one who's performing the greatest act of charity. We might think that it's you know, someone who has wealth, someone who has the financial ability and that is great and that's what sustains this religion. There are reasons why the Holy Prophet ﷺ, for instance, would praise Khadija alayha. Why? He would say that this religion would not have been possible without the wealth of Khadija. Wealth is what makes things work in this world. You need money for things to exist and to move in this world. Okay, We're not saying that it's not important. This religion would not have existed, he says, without the sword of Ali and the wealth of Khadija. You need the protection, you need the courage, you need the bravery, and you need something that allows you to exist in this world. You need food and shelter and people that you can sustain, especially when all of Quraysh is boycotting you and doing everything they can to make you disappear and not be able to survive. Okay, And she sustains the entire religion with her wealth for years until she runs out of money completely. Okay, so we're not saying that this is not important, but we're saying the act of spreading the knowledge is even greater. There's a whole discussion that inshallah will link it to, and inshallah it's clear, it's just uh, we, we highlight it so that the point becomes clear, and this is the link to, therefore, community. And inshallah this is our next heading, right? When we are trying to build a community around knowledge, what does it mean? So here in this hadith, we perhaps have a hint to that. When the Holy Prophet says the greatest act of charity is knowledge that is being disseminated. There's a clear link here with how a community should be established, what the priorities are, and so on and so forth. The next um, heading, and we have multiple narrations around this, and this is what we said in the introduction that we would link back to, is that those who carry the knowledge are the trustees of God. And so we talked about it earlier when we talked about the teacher, we we talked about the scholar, and we said this is part of the duties, the responsibilities of the person who carries knowledge, that you have to feel that you have been entrusted with it. You have to feel like this is a duty or a responsibility that you have. You're carrying something that is not yours. You're carrying it on behalf of God. Okay, But there's another way to look at these ahadith, and I'm trying to minimize this, by the way. There's a lot of ahadith that are either similar, and I've intentionally kept them for later, and maybe some of them sampled are the same ones that we saw earlier, but we're looking at them from another angle here, which is that there's a merit in this. This is a great rank or a great favor or a great merit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to this person who is performing this task in society, the teacher or the scholar. So the general hadith that summarizes all of this, the Holy Prophet says, Al-ulama umana ummati. Scholars are the trustees or the trustworthy ones of my nation. So here it can mean trustee in this way, al-amin or amana, has a lot to do with the person who receives inheritance okay and we have a lot of hadith related to this as well that the true inheritance of scholars knowledge is in fact what they have inherited from prophets or in our case our prophet which we believe is the knowledge of all prophets condensed synthesized in his teachings so in the first meaning what does this hadith mean that they are the trustees of my nation They are trustees of Islam. They are the trustworthy ones of religion. What does it mean? The first is that they are the ones who inherited those things that were entrusted. So they inherited 
the knowledge, they inherited the teachings of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. That's the first meaning. The second meaning here is that from all of my nation, these are the people among my nation, these are the people who are the most trustworthy. Okay, You should be able to rely on them more than you rely on anyone else. That's the second meaning of this hadith. The third meaning, this is where it opens the door to another discussion, is perhaps he is saying they are the ones entrusted or trustees over my nation. When he says, Al-ulama umana u ummati, they are the trustees over my nation. They are the ones that I'm leaving in charge over my nation. That's what he means. This would be a third way of understanding this hadith. And if that's the case, then that changes completely this hadith. And that this is the person who should be given a lot more power and a lot more responsibility. Those are the people that the Holy Prophet is saying should be in charge. The main criteria to be in charge or not is knowledge. To what extent does this person have knowledge of religion? Two ahadith related to this because they allow us to see a little bit further in this hadith. From the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, Al-ulama umana Allahi ala khalqih. In this case, the Holy Prophet said ala. So scholars are God's trustees upon his creation, over his creation. Oh, now we have an indication of the meaning of this hadith. What does it mean when the Holy Prophet says, they are the trustworthy ones in my nation? It's not that they are just trustworthy and among my nation they are the most trustworthy. It's that they are the trustees over this nation. Okay? Another hadith from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu he says, Al-ulama umana Allahi fil ard. Scholars are the trustees of God on earth. So when you combine the ahadith, then you start to quickly see that there is a whole theory emerging here. There is a whole proposed system of being together as a society or as a community where the scholar is playing a very specific role, right? And here, of course, these are the types of narrations that I think reinforce very clearly, and I keep repeating it because I know that this is not intuitive and it's not generally accepted and this is not how people generally understand, but I keep repeating it, I hammer it away so that it becomes second nature for all of us. When we see these al-ulama, who do we think about? Right? And so these to me are very clear ahadith. When the Holy Prophet says they are umana'u ummati or he says umana'ullahi ala khalqih or he says umana'ullahi fil ard. Can we say that about scholars in general? Any scholar will fit this description that these are the trustees of God on earth? No. No way that we can say that. There would be too many exceptions and too many contradictions to this rule. But it would make a lot of sense to say if the true alim means Ahlul Bayt, the true alim means the one who has infallible knowledge, true knowledge, then yes, these ahadith are perfect. They are indeed the trustees of God on earth. They are indeed the ones that the Holy Prophet has entrusted his nation to. The, they are indeed the ones that God has trusted creation under. Right? This is exactly the role of that true alim. Then what about everyone else? Well, once again, to the extent that they represent the teachings of that imam, I have no problem to follow them. No problem to honor them and to respect them and to consider them a scholar and to consider them a trustee of God. Because everything that they carry brings me back to Ahlul Bayt, brings me back to the Imams, to the teachings of God. No problem. Anything else, it doesn't fit this description. I can't say that these are the trustees of God on earth. There's something askew here, there's something missing. The next hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, العلم وديعة الله في أرضه والعلماء أمناؤه عليه فمن عمل بعلمه 
أدى أمانته ومن لم يعمل بعلمه كتب في ديوان الله من الخائنين So the Holy Prophet says knowledge is the trust of God on earth This is what God has entrusted to humanity on this earth and the scholars are its trustees the ones who look after it Whoever acts upon his knowledge fulfills his trust and whoever does not act upon his knowledge they will be listed in the record of God as one of the treacherous. Someone who has betrayed the duty associated with this knowledge. Okay, so this is one further hadith that emphasizes or reinforces what we were saying in the previous hadith. I think we have time to start the next uh, subheading. So there's a number of hadith and just so that we're clear, this whole topic of the merits of the teachers or the scholars in Islam, there's a lot of a hadith around it. But many of them, one, I think they're intuitive and clear and very repetitive in a lot of their teachings. So I try to remove all of those, either because we've covered it already, or there is not much to add to the hadith itself, so one hadith suffices in a lot of cases, or it's already included in a lot of the other hadith that we're seeing. Okay, the points. So there's a number of hadith, for instance, that explain that these are the most beloved creatures to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the scholars, for the knowledge that they carry. I skipped over all of those hadith. That they are the inheritors of prophethood. Okay, in general, there are a lot of hadith. We're going to see a couple, but I wanted to add a dimension to it that is included, but adds to it. They are the closest people or the most similar people to prophets. That's the one that we're going to spend a bit of time on and see a, a couple of hadith. So Abi Abdullah alayhi salam qal, so Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Al-ulama warathatul anbiya. وذلك أن العلماء لم يورثوا درهما ولا دينارا وإنما ورثوا أحاديث من أحاديثهم فمن أخذ بشيء منها فقد أخذ حظا وافرا فانظروا علمكم عمن تأخذونه فإن فينا أهل البيت في كل خلف عدولا ينفون عنه تحريف الغالين وانتحال المبطلين وتأويل الجاهلين so Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says the scholars are the heirs, are the inheritors of the prophets. And this is because, the Imam explains, and this is because the scholars did not inherit a dirham or a dinar. By the way, where do these words come from, dirham and dinar? And what do they mean? Dirham is usually the silver coins in the, at the times that the Imams were talking. The dirham is the silver coin and the dinar is the gold coin. And they come from the Greek tradition and the Roman tradition, where they have the denarius and they had the dirkam. The dirkam comes from the Greek culture, where they had dirkams. Okay, so it become it became dirham. And the denaries the denariuses, let's I don't know if that's the right plural of it, becomes the dinar. Okay, so this is kind of the evolution and where these things were inherited. The Imam is using those terms and he says, it's because the scholars did not inherit. They are inheritors of prophets, but the prophets did not leave behind gold and silver. They did not leave behind financial wealth. What they left behind are teachings. These are the teachings of prophethood. Right? They inherited. So he says, ahaditham and ahaditham. So either he's referring to their sayings specifically, or he's referring to their teachings. They did not inherit all of it. They, inher they inherited sayings from their sayings or teachings from their teachings. So whoever receives some of it, فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْهَا The one who has been able to acquire some of those teachings, some of those sayings, some, the one who is able to acquire some of those teachings, they have indeed received an abundant share. That's already a huge lot that you have received. You're already very fortunate and very lucky if you have been able to acquire some of that, some of those sayings, some of those teachings. Okay, which brings us back to the initial hadith, right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to be good towards a servant, right? That's enough. So the Imam says, 
whoever has been able to acquire some of those sayings, فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْهَا فَقَدْ أَخَذَ حَظًّا وَافِرًا They have indeed received or they have indeed taken a great lot. Then the Imam continues, فَانْظُرُوا عِلْمَكُمْ عَمَّنْ تَأْخُذُونَ Therefore be cautious from whom you take your knowledge. And then he adds, each one of these is a whole discussion. <laughs> and then he adds, فَإِنَّ فِينَا أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ Indeed, among us, Ahl al-Bayt, are those in every era or in every generation those who repel the distortions of the extremists, the false claims of the imposters, and the misrepresentations of the ignorant. Okay, so the Imam here, right away, he gave three categories. There's a lot going on in this hadith. Basically, every sentence the Imam is saying goes in a completely different direction. Adds a completely different layer to the discussion. The first, very quickly, Highlights from the hadith. The first is that the scholars are those who inherit from the prophets. So inshallah that part is clear. And that already gives us an indication of the merit of the scholar. When you see the scholar, when you hear the scholar, the teachings, the, what they're trying to do is to basically bring you back to the teachings of the prophets or the holy prophet himself. Okay, so that's one. Two, a little bit of true knowledge is a great thing. A little bit of true knowledge is already a great thing. And that's what we have been trying to emphasize from the beginning of the series. It's not about quantity. If this is true knowledge, if you deal with it as though this is true knowledge, if it acts upon you and you act based on that knowledge, this is already a huge wealth that you have. If this is true knowledge, a little bit of true knowledge is already a great thing. So then, imagine someone who has a lot of true knowledge. And this again brings us back to the merit of the scholar. Okay, that's second point. The third point, the Imam was very clear. Therefore, be very careful who you choose as your source of knowledge. Be very careful. Um, be careful your knowledge from whom you take it. Be very selective. And then the Imam added, in case now there's confusion. So where do I take? What is the source of my knowledge? Where should I take my knowledge from? And this is where the Imam linked back to Ahl al-Bayt And he said, us Ahl al-Bayt, we are the sources of the true knowledge. And we are there in every generation, the Imam says. There is someone from us Ahl al-Bayt there in every generation. And so here, two meanings. Either the Imam is saying explicitly, we are the true scholars, or the Imam is saying, the true scholars are the ones who represent us. Come to those who are representing our teachings, who are spreading our teachings. Okay, so these are the two ways to understand this hadith. And then the Imam ends the hadith with perhaps a quick listing of some of the duties, responsibilities, of the scholars. When he says that their part of what they try to do is, he says, who repel the distortions of the extremists, those who go too far in their understanding, right? The distortions of the extremists. One. Two. Imtihal is a false claim. When you take something that is not yours, for instance, or you attribute something to someone and they don't, they should not be receiving that which you are attributing to them. Okay, but he says, al these are imposters. Thank you. These are imposters. The third one is, and the misinterpretations. So, ta'wil, ta'wil is to give a meaning, to explain a meaning. He says, this is a misinterpretation of those who are ignorant. In other words, the Imam is saying, I'm giving you one of the roles or characteristics of these scholars. And this becomes a necessary burden on the scholar too. That they are performing this. In short, they are allowing you to find the truth. Because there's a lot of people out there presenting what the truth is. But this is not the real truth. 
And so your job as a scholar, or your job as a learner trying to find the scholar, is to find this person who is able to clear all of that up. To make you avoid, to prevent you from falling into what the extremists, what the imposters, what the ignorant are presenting as being the truth. Okay? Next hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He says, أَقْرَبُ النَّاسِ مِنْ دَرَجَةِ النُّبُوَّةِ أَهْلُ الْعِلْمِ وَأَهْلُ الْجِهَادِ in this hadith, the Holy Prophet ﷺ says the closest of people to the rank of prophethood are the people of knowledge and the people who struggle in the way of God. I think the part that is clear is the greatness of the person who carries the knowledge. This is the point that we're trying to make. This point is clear, inshallah. But this hadith is a little bit more subtle and requires a little bit more of an explanation. Because now in this hadith, there are two categories that were put together. But in fact, many other ahadith, I don't know if we're going to have time for it today, many other ahadith are going to put them in a completely different category. Okay? Here the Holy Prophet is saying, from all the people, if you were to look at the ranks of prophets, or the rank of prophethood in general. And prophethood is a very large, very vast spectrum too. Okay, There were a lot of prophets, and they are not all the same rank. But let's say the bottom of that rank, if we can use that terminology. Who are among the commoners, the people who are closest to that rank? So here the Holy Prophet gave two categories, named two types of people who can be closest to the rank of prophethood. They are the scholars and those who struggle in the way of God. Okay, so this part, clear enough. If you go to other ahadith, and inshallah we're going to see them, we're going to list a couple, just to make this point clear. The Holy Prophet is not saying that those who struggle in the way of God and the scholars are the same category. He's saying if you compare them to everyone else, those are the two categories closest to the prophethood. But even between those two categories, there is a huge distance. And the other ahadith are going to make it clear that the scholars, those who carry knowledge, they can't be compared to those who are struggling in the way of God. Explicitly stated in the ahadith. As good as those people are, and as much better as they are from everybody else, they still can't be compared to those who carry knowledge and who spread knowledge and who act based on the knowledge. Okay? That's one. Very quickly, the second discussion around this hadith would perhaps be for us to ask the question, why? Why would some people be the closest in rank to the rank of prophethood? as a category. So one way, and we've explained this in the past, one way to understand all of these is to say it's all random. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can just decide, you know, he put he gives so and so the highest rank and he randomly chooses someone else and give them a higher rank or a similar rank or a rank just after and so on and so forth. As a lot of people understand these ahadith. But we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do things in vain nor randomly. Everything the Holy Quran says, everything is according to a very precise order and calculation. Everything is organized, everything is fair. So why is it that those are the people closest in rank to prophethood? In short, it's because those are the people who are doing a duty and performing a role that is as close as you can do to the roles of prophets. You are performing the work of prophets. So if you see someone who is supposed to be a scholar, who is not acting like you would expect the prophets to act, then there's something really wrong there. This can be looked at in different ways, but all of them lead to the same conclusion. And we have a hadith in which the Holy Prophet himself says this. He says, because of this was why prophets were sent. It was to take the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to share with humanity and spread it to the people. And this act of spreading it is difficult. There will be many who will resist, many who will fight it, 
This requires a struggle, and this requires sacrifice. The second category. Those who struggle in the way of God. Those are the two categories closest to the prophets. Why? Because those, those are the two categories performing duties, roles, mandates, missions that are closest to what the prophets were themselves doing. The difference is that we are taking from the prophets. And we're not infallible. The prophets were taking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, it was revealed to them. But the work is the same in nature. You are trying to take a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get the people to see it and understand it and act upon it. That's it. If you fall in this category and this is what you're trying to do, then you are performing a prophetic role. A role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to prophets and messengers. So inshallah this part is all clear. The next hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam, again very close, but I think I try to add these hadith together in this order to add a bit of clarity. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, أقرب الناس من الأنبياء عليهم السلام أعملهم بما أمروا به So the people who will be closest or who are closest to the prophets peace upon them, are those who act most in accordance with what they were commanded. So the prophets were commanded or the people were commanded. Those who act the most based on that commandment or those commandments, those are the people who are closest. So, yes, one, and this is inshallah very clear and we spent too many lectures on this for this not to be clear, the importance of action okay when he says a'maluhum not a'lamuhum it's not the most knowledgeable it's the one who acts most based on who acts most based on what they know what was commanded to them those are the people who will be closest but if we look at the previous hadith or even just looking at this hadith what are those commandments how do you know what they are Knowledge. And so again, it brings you back to, you need to know the hadith from Prophet Isa a.s. You need to know, acquire the knowledge, act upon it, and then teach it to others. And you see it in every hadith. Some hadith don't give you the full listing. They emphasize on one or two. And some hadith have all of it. Maybe we look at one more hadith and then we'll stop. Yeah. The next hadith from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and it's also mentioned from Imam Al-Kadhim Alayhi Salam. He says, النظر في وجه العالم and some hadith or some variants of the hadith mention حبا له so النظر في وجه العالم عبادة أو النظر في وجه العالم حبا له عبادة. So looking at the face of the scholar is an act of worship. Or looking at the face of a scholar out of love is an act of worship. So again, a lot that can be said here. I think this hadith is well known too in our religion. This hadith, it might be if someone has not heard it or is not accustomed to it or, or they hear it for the first time, it may be shocking. Okay? If you have not ever encountered this hadith before. So we can preface this by saying we have other narrations that talk about looking at things or people being an act of worship. This is in fact just one form of worship through the eyes. There are multiple. There are seven at least that I could list very quickly. I'd have to do more research or sit and think a little bit more to see if I'm missing some mentioned in the ahadith. But there are at least seven that are mentioned explicitly in the ahadith. One of them, and this is the most famous one, and this would deserve a series of lectures on it, 
This is a unanimously agreed upon hadith by all Muslims, Sahih. النظر إلى وجه علي عبادة. So looking at the face of Ali is an act of worship. That the Holy Prophet says. Okay, so I'm not going to spend more time on that one. The ramifications are many. Okay, but that hadith, that's one hadith. We have a hadith that explicitly state to look at the Kaaba is an act of worship. And it's mustahab. We have many ahadith that say just sit and look at the Kaaba. This is the malaika are recording rewards for you for looking at the Kaaba. What else? Looking inside the Quran. Another fil Quran or fil mushaf. It doesn't say reading. You get reward, you get tawab for looking in the Quran or looking at the Quran. And we have many, many narrations. They come to the Imam, they ask the Imam, they tell the Imam, Should I look in the Quran when I read? And the Imam says, Yes. He tells him, But I know it by heart. He says, Still look, it's good for your eyes. It has too many benefits to list, the Imam says. He tells him, It makes your eyesight stronger. Look in the Quran. And, and so on and so forth. So looking at Imam Ali alayhi salam's face, looking at the Kaaba, looking at the Quran. Okay, so these may seem to be evident. What else? We have a hadith that say, looking at, your, at the face of your parents, looking at the face of your father or the face of your mother. And some ahadith mention with mercy or with compassion. When you look with rahmah, if you feel that mercy when you look at them, if you feel that affection when you look at them, that compassion when you look at them, this is an act of worship. Okay? Next. Even that may be clear. Two ahadith. We have, or two series of ahadith. We have ahadith that say, if you look at the sea, it is an act of worship. The sea, or the ocean, or the water. It is an act of worship. We have a hadith that say, when you look at specifically one type of gemstone, Durr al-Najaf, so I wore it today, Durr al-Najaf. Looking at Durr al-Najaf is an act of worship and it is as though you are performing the visitation. You're going to visit Imam Ali alayhi salam. Okay. And then we have a hadith that say, looking at the face of a scholar is an act of worship. So when we present it this way, then it's not so much of an exception. And inshallah, clearly, we can all see a greater rank to a scholar than, for instance, a gemstone. Or just looking at the ocean. Okay, so it's not that great of an exception, that great of a shock when you put it in this type of presentation or this type of context. That's first. The second point is that why would these matters that were listed in these uh, long variety of ahadith, why would they be acts of worship? Why would it be an act of worship? To look at Imam Ali alayhi salam should be very clear. Even to look at the Kaaba, even though it's not as intuitive as it may seem. The Kaaba in itself is holy, but why? The Holy Quran has verses that talk about this, by the way. They say, for instance, about Mecca. Mecca is supposed to be a haram. Quran refers to it as haram and amina. A secure place that is forbidden for anyone to attack. Right? This is the meaning of haram. And yet the Holy Quran says, all of this, لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد. How can this land still hold sacredness, holiness, if you are disrespected and not allowed to remain in it, to live freely and safely and securely in it? The people of Mecca were chasing the Holy Prophet, trying to assassinate him. It's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Holy Prophet, this holy land means nothing without you being in it safely. This changes completely the equation. 
you are much greater, your safety and your presence here is much greater than the holiness of this land, as holy as it is. So when the Quran or when the narrations, for instance, they tell us that to look at the Kaaba is an act of worship, it's not because of this specific cube made of stones. It's because of its significance. It's because of its what it symbolizes, what it represents. It's not about this thing that you're looking at. There's something behind it that this is pointing to, that this is bringing your mind to, your soul to. This is the significance of what you're looking at. And the same thing would apply, for instance, if you look at, for instance, in the ahadith, the face of your father or the face of your mother. It's because it's supposed to represent something more. It's not just the face, and it's not the face of this person. No, you're recognizing the relationship you have. You're recognizing the right they have. You're recognizing the honor that God has put, the sacredness God has put in this relationship. This is what comes to your mind. Now, maybe not in the words that I'm using, but this is what you feel, and the hadith uses one word for it. It says, نَظْرَةَ rahmah. You feel mercy. You feel what you're supposed to feel, a normal good human being is supposed to feel looking at their father or their mother. If you feel that, this is an act of worship. Because it symbolizes much more than what you're looking at. So if, and the same thing, that's why the hadith say the same thing. It's not about the gemstone. This is insignificant. But where does your mind go to when you know that this gemstone only comes from the valley in Najaf? It goes to Najaf. And the one who is now lying in Najaf, Imam Ali alayhi salam. If this is where your mind goes to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is an act of worship. When you look at Durr al-Najaf. Not because this is a special stone, but it carries significance for what it triggers in your mind. Where it takes your mind. Okay, so it's something a lot deeper than the thing in itself. We're not that superficial. What about the sea? The sea is supposed to, a lot of scholars have spent a lot of time because we have a hadith about this, how soothing it is, how healing it is. It calms the spirit. We have a hadith about this too. And it's fine that it does calm the this, this spirit. But the greatness of the sea is that it reminds you that this is the creation of God. If you're truly at sea and you witness the majesty of the sea and the waves and the the emptiness of it, and it's just water everywhere you look, and you see it, and you think that this has been going on for years and decades and centuries and millennia, you start to appreciate how small you are. You start to appreciate the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is just one of His creatures. And it holds a whole world under it. And so this is where your mind goes. The significance of this. This becomes an act of worship because of where your mind goes. So of course the same thing has to apply when you look at the face of the scholar. Yes, we have a hadith that say looking at the face of the scholar is an act of worship. We have multiple. This is one of them. So let's look at one hadith that explains a little bit of this even though it also contains more. And this is the issue with these ahadith, that they keep opening the doors to a lot of other discussions. So from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, su'ila Ja'far bin Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salam anh. So here, anh can mean two things, and I'll explain it in English too. Either the imam is being asked about this scholar or being asked about this hadith. The hadith that says, looking at the face of the scholar is an act of worship. So, سئل جعفر بن محمد الصادق عليه السلام عنه فقال هو العالم الذي إذا نظرت إليه ذكرك الآخرة ومن كان خلاف ذلك فالنظر إليه فتنة And then the Imam added أغد عالما أو متعلما أو مستمعا أو محبا ولا تكن الخامس فتهلك So Imam الصادق عليه السلام was asked 
about, you know, either. He was asked, who is this scholar that if you look at their face, it's as though you're performing an act of worship? Or the Imam is asked about this narration that says if you look at the face of a scholar, you're performing an act of worship. So he said, it is the scholar who, when you look at him, you remember the afterlife. You remember the hereafter. You remember the day of resurrection, the day of judgment. As for the one whose sight brings about another effect, looking at them is a trial or even a problem, depending on how you interpret this hadith. Fitna. It's an issue. Okay, look, if this is not what it's triggering in you, if when you look at this person who's supposed to be a scholar, it doesn't make you think about the afterlife, it doesn't make you think about the what's awaiting you, the judgment of God and the afterlife, after death and so on and so forth, it's not bringing you closer to God, then this is just causing you more problems, more trouble. Okay, and then the Imam added, and this has nothing to do with our topic, it has to do with the next heading, the Imam says, be a scholar or a student or a listener or a lover, a lover of knowledge. And do not be the fifth, lest you perish. Okay, inshallah, we're going to come back to this one. I want to come back to this hadith. Initially, I had this hadith identified just for community. Okay, the community of knowledge. We're going to come back to it, inshallah. So again, in the previous hadith, we didn't have an explanation. As we said, in a lot of these cases, we might think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just does things randomly. He just wants us to sit and stare at someone's face. And he says, you know, this is just going to be good for you. Trust me. It's just good and it stops there. No, there's a, need, a reason and it's mentioned in the ahadith. So it becomes kind of a condition or a trait that you're looking for. When you look at this person, does it remind you of the afterlife? Does it bring you closer to God? Does it prepare you better for what's waiting after death? This is what you want. If that's not the case, the Imam says, then this doesn't apply. The hadith doesn't, this is not the right person or the hadith does not apply in this case. So when does it apply? Who's the scholar that if you look at them, it's as though you're performing an act of worship. It's the one who brings you closer to what's awaiting after this world, after death. Let's stop here. I think inshallah we covered enough for today. And uh, we'll continue uh, where we left off next time. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Yeah. So the first hadith, because now I know that people can't hear the questions, I thought they could. So the first question has to do with the narration that said that in the afterlife, those who are going to be closest to the rank of prophets are going to be the scholars and those who struggle in the way of God. So how are they, those two categories, equal when there will be other hadith that we have not uh, gone through yet that say that they are different? So in short, without knowing those other hadith, the hadith itself is not saying, for instance, are they equal or not equal? The only thing that this hadith is saying that if you were to look at the rank of prophets in the afterlife, you will see that there are two groups of people that are special, especially close to them compared to every other category. But it's not giving you any order between those two categories, the scholars and those who struggle in the way of God. We just know that they are, you know, apples and oranges, leaps and bounds above everybody else. But between them, we don't know anything. The hadith doesn't talk about anything. When we will go through the other hadith, we're going to see that, no, there's a huge rank between them, a huge difference between them. So that gives you an idea of, then what is the rank between the scholar and the rest of the people who are not even in this category? Okay, but in the, So all I wanted to do is just to park it for now, and those hadith are going to make that clear. But for now, the hadith just makes it clear, and I thought the maybe the relevance or there's a 
interest in mentioning that hadith is also to talk a little bit about the duty and how it's similar to the duties of the prophets. Yeah, there was a second question. Yes. Um, we're talking today about uh, true knowledge. Um, it's just like the dilemma of let's say where to put your time. Um, it, I would say there is also an importance to to building this world in whatever shape or form that is. Uh, the way I'm categorizing it right now is let's say religious knowledge or knowledge from Ahlul Bayt is is more like principles of action, um, how to act. And and um, and uh, um, uh, so when you acquire any other knowledge that might not be religious knowledge, um, if you are applying these principles from Ahlul Bayt towards it and making that knowledge lead you more towards Allah, then that that you're making use of any other knowledge that you acquire. But let's say if if you're uh, an architect, it takes a lot of time and, and knowledge to become an architect. Um, how are you being used? How is it useful for you to be an architect and build and so on when it um, doesn't really have the can't really too much put it towards um, let's say getting closer to Allah to a degree, um, but let's say you can still use the principles of the debate apply it in your work. <coughs> Okay, so this uh, this question is is about the types of knowledge, and today we we uh, used another term. We said you know true knowledge uh, or religious knowledge. In the past, we've talked about and um, linked with the topic of building this world. Linked with the topic, and we have uh, spent a lot of time on that. Any type of knowledge can can be considered religious knowledge if it leads to action uh, in a way that brings us closer to God or is bringing society closer to God or so on and so forth. So these are general principles for sure. One. Two, this does not mean that every type of knowledge is going to enable that in the same way. Now, if you can find a way for that to work, good, great for you. It doesn't mean that every type of knowledge is going to lend itself to be used in that way. And that's where you see the clear difference. The easy answer is, of course, religious knowledge is meant for that. When you are sitting and learning the Holy Quran and learning tafsir or learning, you know, aqaid, learning fiqh, you are squarely 100% within the types of knowledge that are directly bringing you back to understanding God, your relationship with God, and how to act in the world based on divine teachings. Every other type of knowledge, now it's up to you. And we have to add another thing, and inshallah we're going to detail this in a, little, a little bit more when we talk about the types of knowledge. We're going to spend a lot enough time on the types of knowledge, but for now, they're not all of the same level of priority either. And that is very important, in that, yes, maybe there is a way to take any type of knowledge and use it for good, and bring yourself or others closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that type of knowledge. That part is perhaps not the issue. The issue is what is all the knowledge you need first to even be able to start thinking in that way? How much do you have to know in beliefs? How much do you have to know from the Holy Quran? How much do you have to know in from religious teachings in the first place so that when you look at something, you are able to translate it, use it in a way that, yes, this is all about building this world, for instance. It looks like it's entirely material, and yet there is a way to use that for the greater good. So this means that there is an order, there is a sequence. You can do whatever you want afterwards, but you have to follow a certain sequence, and this is what we try to do, for instance, in this series and the one before. There's a reason we start with aqaid. You can be the greatest mathematician and serve humanity in the best way ever. But if you don't have the basics of aqaid, this is all wasted. It can never bring you closer to God or bring humanity closer to God by itself. Maybe people will use it that way, good for them. But for you, you're not getting anything here. Because we said everything derives out of your intention. What was your intention behind this act? Are you doing this for God? 
You do this for God to that extent, yes, you will reap the rewards and the benefits and you will be a scholar. So, yes, everything can be turned into something that brings you closer to God or brings people closer to God. Is it going to be at the same level in every case? Absolutely not. So we all have choices to make. One. And two, there is priorities. And there are things that are necessary to know and to acquire and to spread a lot more than others. There are things that are secondary or tertiary, right? You'll, you will not really get to them right away because there is so much work that first needs to be done at the level of you know, understanding the laws of our religion, understanding the beliefs of our religion, understanding the virtues and the you know, spirituality. Then you will get to the rest of it. Okay, but this does not exclude that. And, you know, you and your resilience and your how much effort you are willing to put in to get there. Okay, I don't know if that, that touches on the answers, but inshallah. I think you asked it in terms of um, um, the, the intention. So when we talked about intention back then, in terms of uh, somebody, two people, the charity, a movement, and a non-movement, is it the same act or not? So yeah, I would say, um, depending on how much backdrop of religious knowledge you have, that you are able to set an intention that could benefit you. Yes. Any action that you do realistically. And to that level of that intention is the level of benefit that you can make. Yeah. And, and your intent, so yes, everything depends on your intention. And your intention can only come out of the knowledge you have. You know, a good example to simplify it would be, when you intend to do something, you can have a very deep intention that a three-year-old or a five-year-old child will never be able to have, right? And this, a lot of this depends entirely on your knowledge. They don't have the maturity to have that type of knowledge to come up with that type of intention, to make it this noble and this sincere and, 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 right? But you can because of the type of knowledge that you have. Yeah. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين